to start chatting tonight about uh, the topic at hand, which is what sort of adjunct treatments or major treatments work best for doing frozen embryo transfers. So this was actually a 108 page, um, I don't even have 108, I have 30 of the 108, because a lot of it was just references, uh, page document from the Cochrane Library. So the first thing they looked at was a stimulated cycle compared to a programmed cycle for women undergoing embryo transfer with frozen embryos or embryos derived from donor eggs. And the reality with this one was that the live birth rate for a stimulated cycle compared to a program cycle was absolutely no different. So whether you took letrozole or you took birth control pill, it did not make any difference. They actually got the same result. Now, I know for sure we've reviewed a study on the show, which was not included here, that actually did demonstrate a benefit. And since then, I've seen several others that also have shown a benefit to using letrozole. So we do use letrozole in our stimulation protocol um, because we think it does help. When they actually looked at the clinical pregnancy rate, it was statistically significant in favor of the patients using letrozole. So live birth rate, was not, but seeing a positive fetal heartbeat was. Um, so that was good. They did not see a difference in miscarriage rates or any of the other outcomes um, that they were looking at. Uh, they did look at the endometrial thickness and they did notice um, that there was a slight difference in the endometrial thickness, but it was not clinically significant. It was 0.05 millimeters difference. So not something we would get too excited about in terms of the thickness of the endometrium. So does stimulated versus program make a difference? It would appear that doing a stimulated cycle may be better, in particular with all of the data coming out about letrozole. Again, we support it and we believe in its use. So then they compared natural cycle to a program cycle. So that's natural versus just um, uh, using birth control pill for programming. And they did not see any difference in live birth rate, in clinical pregnancy rate, or in miscarriage rates. All of those were statistically equivalent. There was no differences between any of them. But they did see a much higher, 40% higher rate of cycle cancellation in the people that got the birth control pill cycle versus the natural cycle. So um, there are some people who will not necessarily respond well when they're doing a frozen embryo transfer and they've previously been on the birth control pill. Um, we do use it from time to time and yet we haven't really seen that high a cycle cancellation rate. Um, but obviously in this particular study, uh, and it was totaling about a total of uh, close to 600 patients, they were seeing a bit of a difference in terms of the success rate of getting to the actual embryo transfer. Some people had to be canceled. Undoubtedly, they'd be canceled because of the fact that their lining was not developing or there was a cyst or whatever the case was. So um, this was significant and it was quite highly significant. Again, it's about a 40% increase in the cycle cancellation rate. So that's really, really important to keep in mind. Okay, what about transdermal estrogens? Well, with the transdermal estrogens, versus the oral estrogens, they said that um, there was actually no difference whatsoever in any of the groups. So they looked at live birth rate, um, they didn't actually have any responses. They looked at clinical pregnancy rate, they said that there was no difference, it was statistically equivalent. And they looked at the miscarriage rate and they said that that was actually the same as well. There is a very, very recent study, it was just out last week, which actually said that the transdermal estrogens had a uh, similar profile in terms of efficacy, but the patients preferred it to taking the oral estrogen. So um, there's no difference in terms of the outcomes, but it's a reasonable thing to consider in terms of the uh, convenience of taking it. Okay, the most important one, because people ask about this all the time, especially with the ERA test and what some people think is so important about the ERA test. And yet again, there was another study just published which showed that it does not help. So the nail, the final nail in the coffin of the ERA test is long gone and done. Um, it is a useless test. So starting administration of the progesterone 
earlier, which was the day before they did the egg retrieval, versus starting it later, which was the day of the egg retrieval or the next day. And that was um, quite highly significant. So there is an 87% increase in your uh, clinical pregnancy rate if you started your progesterone later and not earlier. And that makes total sense because starting it the day before your egg retrieval is birth control. I mean, that's way too early. You will have endometrial asynchrony. So you definitely do not want to start your progesterone too early. You want to start it just on time. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, so this is kind of a, a critical finding in this particular study. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, really important to remember as far as the duration. Now, people ask all the time, what about 120 hours, 124 hours, 130 hours, 100, you know, um, 44 hours. So the data, as far as we know, shows that if it's a day five embryo, you can transfer it after five days of progesterone or six days of progesterone. If you're doing a day six embryo, it should probably be transferred after six days of progesterone. The success rate is not different, different, but your miscarriage rate is lower. And we've actually shown you that on this show before. You can find it on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash Dr. Victory. So we have a whole show dedicated to that study. Okay, what about GnRH agonists compared to uh, control? So this would be using Lupron versus no Lupron. It actually is significant for live birth rate, 162% increase. So when you use the GnRH agonist, they actually improve live birth rate. Um, my argument for that would be that you are normalizing everything so that it's just what you're doing to the patient, which is probably beneficial. And on top of that, if the patient has endo, there may be a benefit for those who have endometriosis and you're reducing the endo. So these are really important findings. Um, interestingly, they did not see a difference with clinical pregnancy rate, miscarriage rate, or any of the other findings, but the live birth rate was very, very uh, significant in that study. Okay, um, what about differences between GnRH agonists? Um, basically, there was no difference, so that was not a really important thing, and I don't think that that would make any sense either. The really interesting thing is they did compare doing a GnRH antagonist to agonists to show what the difference was. And what they demonstrated here was that if you used an antagonist, which is the one like Cetratide or Orgolutran that many of you have used during your IVF cycle, if you use that to prevent the, uh, the ovulation, um, that that actually was superior to using the Lupron. Now, this is not something we've done before, but it may be something we want to start doing soon because we can put people on that. The downside, it's a daily injection. Uh, the upside, it may actually work really well in terms of the success rates um, because it was about a 38% increase when you use the antagonist versus the agonist. I have to freely admit this is not something we've done before, so we might start exploring this. Um, again, there was no significant difference in any of the other categories like miscarriage rate, multiple pregnancy rate, um, cycle cancellation, any of those. Um, they did look at aspirin. We've done shows on aspirin too. Again, on our YouTube channel, you can find them there. So they uh, evaluated the chance with um, uh, using aspirin versus not using aspirin. And in the group that used the aspirin, it was a 500% increase in live birth. So I've supported the use of aspirin before. We've been using aspirin for just about ever. Uh, I think it's a no brainer you want to use aspirin. So um, you should be using aspirin. It reduces preterm labor. It probably reduces preeclampsia. I think the success rates are definitely higher and there's more and more data coming out for that. Finally, and I've tried to keep this show a little bit shorter for this part tonight because we have so many questions to get to. Uh, they did compare steroids versus no steroids for these frozen embryos or patients using donor eggs. And actually there is no statistically significant impact to using steroids. The problem with the steroid part of things is that there are patients that benefit from it 
And um, those are the ones that have either immunological issues, overactive immune systems, sometimes if it's thyroid antibodies. Uh, and so I think you need to be selective about who you're using them for. Uh, Richard Scott, who's a very famous fertility specialist, uh, told me once that years and years ago, he had actually studied this in his own patient population. And when they did so, they demonstrated that there was a significant benefit. And so he never actually changed what he was doing. So um, it's not so much a fact or fiction that, uh, you know, for individual topic, but rather that there are elements of a frozen embryo transfer that are important for you to consider. It looks like using an agonist or antagonist is better than just doing a natural cycle. It looks like um, programming the cycle can have some impact for you, so that has to be carefully considered. And there is no question that it looks like aspirin may be beneficial. So all of these things are things you need to look at as you're going through your own cycle. Um, letrozole does seem to be beneficial, so that um, may be something that we can uh, uh, continue to explore with the patients we're using it on, and hopefully they'll get lots of benefit out of that. So as always, these shows go up on our YouTube channel. They'll be on Instagram for 24 hours and Facebook as well. And if you have any questions or concerns about it, don't hesitate, reach out to us. Um, it is available through the Cochrane Library. So if you have access, um, don't hesitate to go check that out. And uh, we will be back with hopefully another exciting topic next week on that. For now, we're going to go to questions and I'll just take a few of the ones we have here on Facebook uh, and YouTube, and then we can jump into the long list of Instagram questions. So, 